Kent to the, Kent to the screen to introduce our speaker. You're muted, Kent. There we go. And I, Karen, is he on? I don't see him. Well, let me go ahead and start and we'll see uh, how, where we go. Um, I have the, uh, the honor of having with us today, Balaji Nahram Siman. He's an Anson Marston Distinguished Professor at the, and the faculty chair in chemical and biological engineering at Iowa State University. He directs the Nano Vaccine Institute, which is an interdisciplinary consortium of universities, national laboratories, research institutes, companies, and hospitals. And it's focused on the design and development of next generation nano vaccines. He is a co-founder of a startup company called Immuno Nanomed. He's won an incredible assortment of awards and recognition. He's co-authored 300 referred articles, 10 patents, and three textbooks. And he's delivered over 400 invited and contributed lectures. After today, we'll make that 401. He's an associate editor of Science Advances and section editor of Current Opinion in Chemical Engineering. Balaji received his BTech in Bombay and a PhD from Purdue University, both in chemical engineering, and he completed his postdoctoral work at MIT. And with that, I don't know where he is. So um, anybody see Kelsey? Here I am. I do not see him. Do we? Let's see. I'm going to try to log on to the Iowa State website and get his phone number. Sorry, you all had to see me eating homemade spaghetti. I'll take my video off. <laughs> Making us hungry. <laughs> I like the shirt. The A little bit of holiday flair. Kudos to the Cyclones for a great week. Woo! Park, I'm a little jealous of your Christmas tree behind you. It looks uh, a little bit warmer than the one I've got. Are you not gonna comment about Jeannie Roberts' tree? Oh, I already did. Oh, I missed that, sorry. Karen's got a nice one behind her too. Thanks, so Steve. Is, is everybody ready for Christmas? No. No, not, not much to go, but I still have a few things. And we can be patient if you want to call over to that, to his office, yeah. Does anybody like wrapping presents? Not as much yeah. as unwrapping. Yeah, right. It just wasn't something that I was blessed, the talent that I was blessed with. I just, I don't like it. I don't like making the corners just right. I don't like adding ribbon. My mom though is a professional. She can wrap a present. That's why you use gift bags. I know, so do I. 
I reached out to his associate who's been helping us. She's going to reach out to um, Balaji. And um, she said this morning they talked and he was all ready to go. So, so oh, yeah. I'm not sure uh, what happened with the connection. Okay. It's Monday. It's yeah. Monday. Hopefully he's okay. Mm -hmm. What is our schedule for the next few weeks? Uh, next, we are having our holiday trivia party at the alumni. Wear your festive wear. So if you have a Christmas sweater or a pin, you want to put a little barrette in your hair with the bow, that's encouraged. And then the following week, we do not have a meeting, correct? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and then um, we'll be off until um, after New Year's. And then when we come back, let me, I'm opening up the schedule here. Uh, I have the old schedule. Oh, uh, we have Eric, uh, who's the communications, Eric uh, with communications director with the uh, uh, Ames Community Schools will be on January 10th. Um, we're still trying to work on our January 17th um, UR Rotary um, uh, have invited Wayne Clinton to share with us. That's Martin Luther King Day. And on uh, January 31st, we have Raya Spigner from KCCI coming on. And I know I have the 24th, but I don't remember who it is. So Kent, there's no meeting on the third? Correct. Thanks, Kent. You're letting me update my calendar right now. I appreciate that. You're all very welcome. Going back to the Christmas wrap, I did that for 30 years, and my biggest challenge was umbrellas. Think about wrapping an umbrella with the handle at one end and nothing at the other. <laughs> wow. That's dedication if you wrap, you actually wrapped it and didn't just, you know, present it as is. Oh no, we wrapped everything. Is anyone buying a gift for a 13 year old boy? Because that is a tough gift to find. Mm -hmm. And what did you guys get that 13 year old boy if you did? Electronics well, way back in the summer. Like a Nintendo Switch or what? I think that's what it's called. Well, my 13-year-old grandson wanted uh, a mug for his tea. Not sure I like the message on it, but it came via mom. And then a sweatshirt and a book. Hey, that's okay. Yeah. What book? What book? Oh, um, let me look at the Amazon order. And what was the message on the mug? About don't. There was a goose with a baseball bat, and it says, don't mess with the honk or you'll get a bonk. <laughs> um, Balaji should be joining us in just a moment or two. He thought we were starting at 12.15, so oh, okay. we, went, we went through business a little bit faster than uh, we would have anticipated. So, um, No problem. Hey, I'm here. Oh. Ah, well, I've already taken the pleasure of introducing you, but let me say again, we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to share about this incredibly fascinating area of science. Thank you, Balaji. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, sorry, my understanding was that uh, you were finishing up some business for the first 15 minutes of the meeting. So I made sure that uh, I gave you the time for, for that before joining. So if I'm late, I... Uh, 
apologize, but uh, I do have a, a 20, 25 minute or so presentation here planned. Um, so I'm, I'll make sure to leave plenty of time for, for questions. Uh, but I want to thank Ken and, uh, and all of you for, for being here today. And, um, uh, and I'm happy to uh, talk to you a little bit about the kind of work we're doing. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope that's visible to everybody. Excellent. So um, again, my name is Balaji Narsimhan. I'm a professor in chemical and biological engineering here at ISU, and uh, I'm also part of the Nano Vaccine Institute on campus. My lab works on research that is at the intersection of, uh, of chemistry, medicine, and nanotechnology. And what I'm here to tell you today um, is about some of the developments associated with this uh, nano vaccine technology that we're all uh, pretty excited about. Uh, and, and, and I hope that uh, this will um, spur some good discussion here with your group as well. Um, so this is a disclaimer that I'm required to present. I'm a co-founder of a company as well as I have a financial interest in another one. So I wanna start off by thanking everybody that made the work that I'm gonna show you possible. Um, I get to stand here and, and say, uh, you know, give, give talks about this work, but really this work is the culmination of some awesome creativity that uh, a number of students and postdocs um, have, have shown in the lab and some um, very uh, 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 cutting edge collaborations that our lab has been able to establish together with researchers at a number of other institutions. So I wanna thank all of them up front for, for their awesome contributions to this work. And then last but not least, I wanna thank um, all the funding agencies who trusted us um, with their resources to be able to carry out the work that we do. The, the work that we do is, is quite resource intensive and we would not be able to do it without the generous contributions of these funding agencies. So I wanna also uh, uh, give them a thank you right up front. So um, let's start uh, with a very big picture view here. Um, in the last uh, 50 years or so, um, the percent of our GDP that our, that our healthcare is costing has, uh, has almost um, trebled, uh, if, not, if not close to trebling, uh, and, and the current cost is about 18% of, of our GDP. So, so healthcare is, is big, and, and, and of course it's, it's growing. And then, um, you know, not that that's challenging enough, but we have some other uh, uh, challenges that, that are as well um, in, in front of us today as, as we all live. The for the first time in our nation's history, in a, in a short 14 years, so in 2035, we are going to have a higher percent of our population that are over 65 compared to children who are under 18. Um, and this is a scissor curve. Once you cross it, there's no going back. And so, so we're all living longer. And, and that percent, as you can see by the middle of the century, is almost going to be at about a quarter of our population. So, so we're living longer. And so there's a significant need for, for healthcare technologies to address this issue. We're also, as a country, becoming more obese. That is a significant problem. Um, I saw a recent article um, two days ago that said that people had found uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in fat. And, and that is one of the places where the virus resides. And that's one of the reasons why people with obese conditions are, are seeing more of an effect of, uh, of viral diseases, like, for example, COVID-19. We're ODing on antibiotics. So what the bugs are doing is they're becoming more resistant to the kinds of standard therapies that, that antibiotics provide. And that's creating resistance. And that is a significant problem when we get to bug antibiotic resistant um, diseases that are, are another huge issue. As this pandemic has shown, there are a number of underserved markets in our, in our, in our populace. And having the ability to reach all of them is a very important aspect of getting all of us to the point where we can, we can get out of these kinds of pandemics. And then of course, um, we have had a number of uh, re-emergence um, of known diseases that we thought we'd gotten rid of. I've been at ISU 20 years and I, I remember more than once um, whooping cough uh, uh, coming to campus. And this is a disease that there's been a vaccine for for a large number of years, right? And of course, in 2014, we were all uh, more than made aware of this big scare that we had due to Ebola, which is another disease that, that we thought was, was endemic to certain parts of the world. And then, of course, you know, in this short 20 plus years of this new century, um, we've already seen new pandemics. We've seen the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, and of course, we're living through one right now. There's also biowarfare threats and a shortage of medical professionals. So all in all, a very challenging situation. So what I'm here to tell you is that we need new tools to, to solve these big problems. And, and nanoparticles offer a way to, to 
you know, to, 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 to solve some of these or at least partially solve some of these problems, particularly with respect to delivering vaccines and therapeutics. So today I'm going to tell you mostly about work that the Nano Vaccine Institute at Iowa State is, is leading in developing vaccines against respiratory infections. Uh, I'll focus mainly on flu, but also touch upon some other, um, other aspects as well as we go on. So first of all, what is, nano, what is a nanoparticle? Um, and, and how big is a nanoparticle? Maybe a question that, that many of you may have. So imagine this little dot here. I hope you can see my cursor. That's the flu virus. Um, the COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, is not too dissimilar. Um, so our nano vaccine particle is a particle that's about 15 times bigger than a flu virus. And if you compare that to a, a human red blood cell, so you go to a doctor's office for a, for a blood test, um, this is what they look for, the, your human red blood cells under the microscope. And these human red blood cells are about um, 20 to 25 times bigger than the nano vaccine particle. And this, this, uh, the thickness of this green line here is the thickness of a dollar bill. And if you write a, a, a period, if I put a period at the end of one of these bullets, that's how big that period will look. This is part of the, that period that's gonna of course cover this whole, whole you know, circle there. So that's how tiny a flu virus is and that's how tiny a nano vaccine particle is. So why are they so tiny and why is this helpful to us? They're, the reason why we make them these small is because they can be easily internalized by immune cells. And they can also be formulated into, into suspensions or dry powder aerosols, which I'll talk about quite a bit uh, in today's, uh, today's talk. Um, we, can, we can tailor these nanoparticles to, to look like viruses or bacteria and essentially tell our immune system, hey, you know, generate an immune response. And, and that's really what we want these vaccines to do is generate that immune response. What I'll also show you is that these nano vaccines, as we call them, release their payloads slowly over time. And we are able to uh, reach different parts of the body with, with these particles and in particular target disease sites. So as an example, we're focusing on respiratory infections. So the lungs are an important um, tissue for us. And so how do you target that, uh, that tissue site is, is one thing that nanoparticles are really good at. So um, what the Nano Vaccine Institute does is take, the, uh, take advantage of these types of nanotechnologies. And then our vision is that this is how we're gonna be able to prevent and treat disease in the future. So we have um, a consortium of uh, close to 80 researchers from 24 institutions. You can see our team here. Um, this team is made up of uh, researchers at universities, researchers at hospitals. So you see the Mayo Clinic, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, so two hospitals. They have two national labs, one in New Mexico and one right here in Ames, Iowa. And we also have research organizations and think tanks. And then on the right here, we have companies. These are all companies that are working at the cutting edge of, of healthcare. So the reason we have this team is that to solve the type of complex problems that we're attempting to here, no one institution is gonna have the expertise. And so bringing together a team like this is absolutely the way to go. So the approach we use is something I'd like to call bedside to bench and back. That means we, we go to the bedside, we understand what the problems are, we come back to the lab bench, we try to come up with solutions, then we go back to the bedside and see if we've solved those problems. And if we haven't, we come back and iterate through this process again. So that's really the, the vision of the, of the Nano Vaccine Institute. So, we have a lot of different targets um, that our team is working on. I'm gonna focus again today on, on respiratory infections, but we have projects that are associated with cancer, uh, with neural disorders, particularly um, uh, uh, neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So we have technologies based on the nanoparticles that we design here that can uh, impact those kinds of uh, neural disorders. And then we also have projects associated with tropical disease, animal health, and, and aging. Um, our current funding is, is upwards of $25 million. And like I said at the beginning, we're very fortunate to have um, funding agencies called um, uh, uh, structure, chemical structure that I'll show you in this slide. Uh, but this is, this is the material that our, our, our polymers are made of. And this material is actually FDA approved. Um, in the mid 90s, the FDA approved this treatment called the glietal wafer, which is made up of the same types of materials that we use in our nanoparticles. And what this wafer does is it releases a, an anti-cancer drug. And what a surgeon would do is remove brain tumor and then place several of these wafers inside the But 
wafer, they're made of these tiny particles. These particles that I show contain uh, proteins that come from different flu strains, for example. So our flu nano vaccine would contain flu-related payloads. Our COVID nano vaccine would contain, it has no live virus. It has nothing that's living that could give you disease, big to the type of disease that we are um, targeting. And then as I mentioned before, these particles can reach targeted locations. They can release dosage slowly and more these using, using an inhaler, which is just something that we're all familiar with. So let's talk about flu. So I hope everybody in this, um, in this call has had a flu shot. Um, if not, please get one soon. But flu is, is, a, is, a, is a huge issue in, in, in our, it's, a, it's an age. In a, in a given flu year, you know, up to one fifth of the at high risk of infection. So for example, if you look at hospitalization rates here, you see that the two highest rates here are at the opposite ends of the This is individuals over 65, and then the green is children uh, four and below. So those are the two that are most impacted by flu-related hospitalizations, and that is 13. These are, are hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, and these are the two that many people use in, in their vaccines. So to prevent the flu, um, it, is, it is only about 45% effective overall. Um, and, and there are two current rates. This is a shot that I think most of us would have received uh, if we received the shot. And that is uh, basically a, a cocktail of that are present in the flu shot. Um, if you are below um, um, vaccine, so that means uh, uh, it has a For, for children. And this has been a main reason is the the the, uh, the cocktail of flu vaccines that we use in the based on on what has chain to carry 
um, about doses of the J and J vaccine or, or the or the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that needed to be stored very, very cold, and if they were cold, cold conditions, you you have wastage and you have this cold. chain is estimated to cost up to 80% of the cost of a single dose and, and is, you know, a wall. You can do this without a cold chain, and you can administer this yourself without the need for a healthcare professional. That is the type of advantage to reduce manufacturing time, self flu and the same thing is applicable of course to, to COVID. So we can And create vaccines that can protect across multiple variants from multiple strains. But RSV, which is another disease. So let me show you a little bit of data describing to you in three different animal models. So this is vaccinate them with, with our flu nano vaccine and then hit them with a virus. In pigs, you can see that banana vaccine administered animals did not show any clinical. But if you not, they don't develop any clinical signs of disease, which is significant. Um, other also store these vaccines at room temperature 
for long periods of time. So the, the shelf life stability of the room temperature. So or in the form of implants that can be placed inside, especially these larger animals like horses, um, so that they don't have to come back again for frequent treatment. So we can in, in, uh, administer these vaccines very safely uh, using inhalable uh, uh, formulations like this, or like I said, uh, implant-based formulations like this. So again, a lot of potential for, for animals as well. So the technology is very plug and play. I, I, I told you we learned from our flu work and moved to COVID. So here's a, a snapshot of what can happen in the future. So imagine these inhalers containing SARS-CoV-2 nano vaccine delivered at no cost to every household within let's say 50 days of a, a new uh, a pandemic or a new virus that comes into our world in the future. That is the type of future that I imagine that institutions like Iowa State and organizations like the Nano Vaccine Institute can make happen is, is create this kind of future where we don't have to go through this, this extended period of, uh, of dealing with a complicated new virus in our world. Same thing with a biodefense pathogen. Imagine dropping a pallet of these inhalers into an outbreak zone and not risk the health of any medical staff. So everybody who's in that zone can pick up an inhaler and vaccinate themselves. Same thing for cancer. We can engineer these particles to particularly target cancer cells with a fraction of the chemotherapy that's now required. Now you can also you do drug delivery with these. I talked about vaccines for the most part, but instead of taking drugs conventionally, if you put these drugs into nanoparticles, you can have fewer administrations, you can hit the, the targeted uh, type of tissue that you need, so you can have a high local dose and use a lot less of the drug, which could also circumvent the problem of resistance that I mentioned to you before. So very quickly, we have developed vaccines against uh, 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 pathogens that, are, um, uh, that cause diseases like lymphatic filariasis, so these are uh, particularly insidious in, in certain parts of the world, and again, require of drugs to treat. We can also reduce antibiotic dose and, and reduce resistance in these systems. And as I mentioned, we can deliver these drugs which, are, which could be toxic, but again, reduce their dose to deliver them into the brain to slow down processes like Parkinson's or, or Alzheimer's. So again, a lot of potential for the use of these for, for drug delivery as well. So this is all very um, uh, interesting to the state of Iowa, which uh, we're very happy to see has invested in this area as, as a bioscience platform of interest for the state. So Iowa created uh, four bioscience platforms uh, a few years ago, and vaccines and immunotherapeutics is, is one of them. And we think Iowa is, is, is well positioned to become a leader in this area because of this unique confluence that we have here with the research capabilities at our research institutions, with the significant amount of vaccine and animal health industry that has a footprint in Iowa, and then the large regulatory expertise that the USDA brings, which is again, housed in Iowa. So this triangulated set of assets that the state of Iowa has, we think positions us very well to expand partnerships that creates new jobs, but also uh, positions us as a vaccine hub and enhances our preparedness for, for future pandemics. So again, that's what the NanoVaccine Institute does. We, we design, deliver, and deploy these rapid, um, um, uh, in, in a rapid way, these platforms for next generation vaccines. Here is one of those that uh, you see that can be used to deliver a vaccine and you can operate it yourself as you'll see her demonstrate in a second here. So there's this purple button that she'll press and you'll see the dry powder vaccine that's gonna come out of here. And that in my opinion is a great example of the type of future that we can build with collaborative research and a vaccine institute and, and our partners of our farming. 
So thank you again for your attention. And uh, if there's time here, I'd love to answer a few questions. It looks like Tom Walsh had one. Which RT nano vaccine have been approved by the FDA and ready for human use? Which new nano vaccines are foreseen in the near future for animal and human use? You can probably see that too, but. I can, thank you. That is a very good question. So um, in case you didn't know, um, the COVID vaccines are nano vaccines. Um, so the FDA has already approved um, a nano vaccine for human use, which is the COVID vaccine that, um, that many of you may have received. Now, as you know, the COVID vaccine is not room temperature stable. So there is no RT nano vaccine that has yet been approved by the FDA because one doesn't exist. Um, there are nano vaccines like the COVID one, uh, which, is, uh, room which is not room temperature stable, but uh, still composed of, um, of nano vaccines. Now, which ones are foreseen in the near future? Um, I'd say I'd say flu is probably the one that's, if I were to guess, um, would be the next one on the horizon. Um, there's been a lot of work on on the flu vaccine um, with respect to the use of nanotechnologies, and and the reason and and, and, and since flu has some issues, namely the the, the guesswork and the fact that we're not, uh, you know, at the levels of efficacy that we'd like. Um, my expectation is is flu will be one of the next ones that uh, I think would go into humans. With animals, I think, um, again, any, any type of uh, respiratory infection, whether it's RSV or, or flu um, or pneumonia or any of these um, uh, upper respiratory and lower respiratory infections that impact animals are excellent opportunities for, for nano 